Maryland live in one minute. Welcome to Lynn Cullen Live at PGHCityPaper.com. Email your questions and comments to Lynn at PGHCityPaper.com. Hello there and welcome to Lynn Cullen Live for November 27th, 2012. There's a facsimile of snow outside the window. Sort of incontinent flurries. Uh, I suspect not amounting to much of anything. Anyway, it feels a little more like winter. Uh, and that concludes the weather report. Jeez. Um, I missed my bus stop again today. I, 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 I'm, I'm, this is getting to be a habit. I've now become one of the people, when I first started riding the bus, um, Three years ago, you may recall that I ranted about how everybody was in their own universe. Everybody had their heads down. They were scrolling around through their iPhones, their iPads. They were blah, 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 blah. And nobody was noticing this little universe on wheels and all of the interesting people on it and all of the interesting interactions and the questions that would arise in your head as you looked at your fellow passengers and wondered, who are they? Where the hell are they going? And I felt I was the only one who was engaged in this pursuit because everybody else seemed totally oblivious to the rest of us. I thought it was a shame. I thought just looking out the window was interesting. Well, now count me as a bus riding veteran, because now, quite clearly, I've become one of the people with my head down. I don't notice anybody. I barely interact with anybody. And um, as because of that, I'm inclined not to pay any attention whatsoever to where the rolling universe I'm on is uh, at any moment in time, and consequently have now, in the last few weeks on more than one occasion, uh, looked up to see buildings I shouldn't be looking at, buildings that suggest that I missed the stop I was to get off at. And uh, that happened again today. So I was a little bit late in getting into the studio, but uh, here I am, and it's so funny, I mean, to realize that I've become one of those indifferent <laughs> people <laughs> wrapped in my own world. And we're and actually now there's even more gizmos that people are dealing with. So you got people with um, you know, nooks that I don't did they even exist three years ago? I suppose they did. Uh just about. But you you know, it's <sighs> anyway, that's it. Anyway, 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 what are we going to talk about? I know it's Tuesday. My sister Susan cannot be with us today. Uh, and that leaves you <laughs> with me. One of the more interesting things I came across today in my perusal of uh, the numerous newspapers that I still get delivered to my front door, how much longer can that last? How much longer can that last? I might be the only person in the world, in the city at least, who gets five newspapers delivered to the... Huh? 
I don't know who else would do such a thing. Or if anybody else does such a thing, I bet I'm the youngest. <laughs> and, oh, geez. And that's saying something. Well, I was realizing uh, that as I peeled the papers off the porch uh, today that this is going to not be able to happen much anymore. And just as, I mean, I find that unthinkable, but just as that's unthinkable, I will make that transition as I made the transition from the naive, fascinated new bus rider to the indifferent bus rider. But it took me like over three years to do that. All right, well, so it'll happen. So my most interesting thing that I found in all these newspapers that I looked at today, and you see I, I rip things out. You should see what my house looks like. I mean, there's scraps of newsprint everywhere. You would never want to say, uh, do you have today's paper? Could I please see it? You would never want mine. It has large ripped holes in it. Anyway, I don't know if you ever listen to audiobooks, but uh, I do. And when I do, I do driving long distance. And I have found that it's a wonderful way to make a trip um, go more quickly. But it's quite clear that it has to be a certain kind of book. Because if it's a book that requires too much of your attention, you realize that there are times when, for instance, an oncoming car is headed right at you, that you cease to pay attention to the book and instead are 100% alert to your driving responsibilities. And then by the time you avert catastrophe and your adrenaline levels have dropped to a reasonable level again and you realize that the person is still yap, yap, yapping and the book has moved on a few pages, you, you then get a little bit behind and, and you can't catch up. So it takes a certain kind of book that works. Um, and it can be fiction or nonfiction. I, um, but you need a book that will hold you but not hold you so much that you're a danger on the road. Unless you think that you can't be a danger on the road while you're listening to a book, I give you none other than a scientist at Carnegie Mellon University right down the street here. His name is Marcel Just, or maybe it's Marcel Just, I don't know. And he is the one who is cited for research in which he shows that simply listening to a cell phone conversation while you're driving means that your driving skills are impaired. So this is sometimes cited when legislatures uh, suggest that we need we need to uh, have laws where people can't uh, call on their cell phones. But it turns out his research says that when you're listening to a phone call, so even if you have a hands-off device and you're listening, he says that the brain activity that was there for driving, you know, you're driving and then the call comes in and it's hands-off and you're just listening to the call. The minute that speaker on the other and starts to talk, your driving skills, your brain activity, let's, let's put it this way, your brain activity that is involved in the act of driving decreases by as much as 37%. That's huge. And that's just listening. And apparently... Listening to a person who's in the car with you does not produce that same level of drop-off. Pick up and then drop off. I'm sorry. That's um, um, So, 
back to audiobooks. So when you're listening to an audiobook, depending on what the book is, it, you are making a deal uh, with yourself that I will not, I will not have as much brain activity focused on driving. And that's why the choice of book is very important. Now, I want to bring up audiobooks not in driving, but in jogging. Because you got to figure putting one foot in front of the other is such a basic kind of a human activity that there's no way that, for instance, listening to a podcast of this program while getting your exercise would in any way be detrimental. And uh, that's relatively true. Although, here's another psychologist saying he researches multitasking. And obviously, if you're listening to a book while jogging, you are engaged in the act of multitasking. And this guy, Daniel Willingham at the University of Virginia, says that when you do, this is just a given, when you do two things at once, there's always a cost. And so all of these young people who are constantly doing 20 things at once and think they're handling it because they appear to be handling it, there, of course, is not their true focus on any one of these activities. But it turns out that nearly um, a quarter of all the people who do listen to audiobooks listen to them while exercising. And I would think that jogging while listening is, well, who knows? I don't know. Anyway, here's what I want to get. <laughs> and listening, by the way, if you listen to music while you're exercising, that's very different to the brain than listening to an audio book. And, and in fact, I bet you can guess it's better because music, first of all, the lack of verbal stuff that you've got to listen to. Oh, wait, 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 wait. So I'm saying music, instrumental music. If it's music with lyrics and you're trying to hear the lyrics, that obviously re takes peels off a lot more of your brain activity. But if it's an instrumental, then you're in better shape. Uh, the idea of listening to a book while you're doing something else is not something that has just happened because of our ability to multitask now with all these gizmos we have. I remember reading once that, ha that in a lot of the sweatshops in the Lower East Side in New York, at the uh, in the early 1900s, all those seamstresses and other people engaged in in activity for hours and hours on end would sometimes take a cut in their pay. They would all take maybe who knows what a penny out or a nickel out, and with what they ended up with, they would hire somebody to read to them while they worked, which is a wonderful idea, wonderful idea, so that they were engaged, their brain was engaged while their, their, their work was being done. And even in the Middle Ages, that kind of thing uh, went on. So the idea of listening to a book while doing something else is hardly new. But all of this is not what I wanted to tell you about. <laughs> she took 12 minutes on something she didn't intend to talk about? Yes, I did. What I intended to talk to you about is that somebody has actually figured out if you are running at a certain pace and you are bound and determined to listen to an entire book how many calories you, bur you can burn on certain books. And the winner, at least, of their 
whatever books that they looked at, is uh, Anna Karenina. Now, Anna Karenina strikes me as not the kind of book to listen to while jogging. All those Russian names, for one thing, get you so bollocked up, you don't know who's who. At least if you're reading it yourself, you start, you know, oh, that's the name that begins with a P, and that one begins with a B. Because I once made the mistake of listening to War and Peace on audio. Ay, ay, ay. I did. I listened to the whole thing, but it was rough. It was rough. It was rough. Anna Karenina, as read on an audiobook, requires 341 hours <laughs> of listening. Do you believe that? 341 hours. Who's going to do that? But if you do do it, you will travel 204 miles, and obviously you're going to burn a hell of a lot of calories. So as it turns out, the more I think about this, this is stupid. Obviously, just go by the page count, right? And in fact, The Great Gatsby, which is a much shorter book, uh, only takes five hours to listen to, and it burns, you know, nowhere near as many calories. You only run 28 miles. That's if you're running pretty, pretty darn fast, I think. Fifty Shades of Grey is way up there, girls. I have yet to lay my fingers on that book, and I won't. Uh, did you read it? I haven't. I haven't read it. You haven't read it? Don't bother, okay? <laughs> anyway, all of this from the health and fitness section of today's Wall Street Journal. Uh, the headline, What Makes Dickens a Lousy Running Buddy? <laughs> I think it was the headline that got me into it in the first place. Anyway, wanted to share that with you. I'll be damned if I'm doing all politics all the time. And here's the other incredible thing I came upon. Where the hell is it? Well, I don't even need it. I can remember it. So, um, Les Miserables uh, is coming out as a movie. It's, I guess, coming out in about a month. And uh, Anne Hathaway is, is in it. And she, I guess, sings in it. I didn't know she could sing. She, she took hours. I mean, the kind of work that some of these actors do to get ready for a part is amazing. But in the part of, of Fantine, Fantine, she has to lose a lot of weight. She has to look like she's dying. Now, I look at Anne Hathaway on a good day and think it looks like she's dying. She has no body fat at all. She is so skinny. She's one of the people I bumped into right down here on the corner. She and Jake Gyllenhaal. Is that his name? When they were filming that awful movie about drug, uh, love, and other love and other drugs. That thank you, Jess. Love and other drugs. Anyway, she was so thin. It's frightening. So she realized she had to lose a lot more weight because she doesn't think she's so thin. She looks sick. She thinks she's so thin. She looks like a Hollywood star, and she's right. Listen to how she lost. Wait. And Jess, I know you and I struggle, and here's all we have to do. We can do it in about two and a half weeks. We can lose 25 pounds. Of course, I don't think that's healthy. But here's what she did. She started with a strict cleanse what's that it's something awful like liquids only and um are you sure they don't like stick tubes up you and make you you know it's like you're having a colonoscopy and you know like i'm not so sure either everything in you is right. out a colonics. Col colonics or whatever the hell that is okay the strict cleanse took 10 pounds off her okay then she got serious for two weeks, all she ate per day was two thin squares of dried oatmeal paste. That's it for two weeks. 
I mean, I think like a prisoner in a North Korean prison camp gets better than that. Two squares, thin squares of dried oatmeal paste a day for two weeks. And that took 15 pounds off. That's nuts. That's, that's, you know, violative of your body. Anyway, so when you see the movie, if you do, and you see that she looks like she's dead, half dead, she practically was. And I don't know if you've seen pictures of Matthew McConaughey, because he's lost a horrific amount of weight for an, another role. I don't know how they do that. And he looks sick for their craft. For their craft. Now, if I could just, here's how to diet then. Just pretend you're a Hollywood star. You have a movie and you have to report on set in three weeks and they want you 20 pounds down. And you do it, right? You need that kind of motivation. You have no choice. You would just do it. So if you, can, if you can force yourself to pretend, then maybe you got a shot. I, on the other hand, wouldn't even try. All right, I'm going to take a break. If there's anything you guys want to talk about, you let me know. I do have some political stuff, but God, I'm just taking a little bit of a break. This fiscal cliff crap, I am not getting into that until... It's December 25th, and they still haven't reached agreement or something. And I'm assuming that's not going to happen. Um, you know, anybody seen Lincoln, by the way, uh, the Spielberg movie? Because that is a behind-the-scenes look at how, you know, sausage gets made, about how legislation gets passed often. And I think in... in in that regard, it's it's you know it's somewhat somewhat of a of a very good uh, history lesson that you know even the most noble of ventures like the freeing of the slaves, the Thirteenth Amendment, and and um, even the most noble of presidents like Abraham Lincoln engage in pretty awful tactics. Bribery, <laughs> threats, uh, yeah, all kinds of stuff. And I know historians have quibbled about a lot of it, but it, it's still pretty fascinating uh, to look at happen. All right, I think I was taking a break. Uh, we'll take a break. If you do have something you want to contribute, feel free. Phone number there behind me. If you're not seeing it, it's uh, 412-316-3381. And obviously, that applies only to you who are listening in real time. Okay? You can also email me at lynn at pghcitypaper.com. Email your questions and comments to lynn at pghcitypaper.com or call Lynn at 412 316 3381. Lynn Cullen Live will return in a moment. Winter has arrived and it's cold outside. So get to Littles for all your UGG needs. Littles has UGGs for men, women, and children to stay warm with shearling lined boots, shoes, and slippers. And don't forget to get your hats, gloves, scarves, and more. All available at Littles Shoes. Bring the entire family to view one of the largest in store UGG shops in the U.S. Littles Shoes, Pittsburgh's largest family shoe store. 5850 Forbes Avenue in Squirrel Hill. Who needs Black Friday? Go to BurgBargains.com for great deals every day from the top restaurants, museums, and shows in the Berg. This week, only 60% off gift certificates to Misaki. BurgBargains.com, Pittsburgh's exclusive e-commerce mall. BurgBargains.com. This is the sound of a flat-screen television hurled off a building. Now the new bike your kid wants. These are the things you could have all cast into oblivion. Because when you throw away money on wasted electricity, you throw away everything you could have bought with it. Use Energy Star light bulbs and appliances, and you could save hundreds of dollars a year. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Energy and the Ad Council. 
Have a question or an opinion? Call Lynn Cullen at 412-316-3381 or email lynn at pghcitypaper.com. Now, more with Lynn Cullen Live. You know, I speaking of Lincoln, I have said a million times that um, the Civil War, which purportedly the North won, <laughs> it just seemed the way our politics have been in in the last 25 years, it seems like the South never really surrendered. And um, even though the party of Lincoln um, is, I mean, it's odd. Republicans often say, you know, it was the Republicans who freed the slaves. They were the Republicans. They were the Democrats. The Solid South was all the Democrats. And it was meh, meh, meh. As if they were like the, the fact is, is that the South did a total turnaround um, when LBJ uh signed the Civil Rights Act, and that, and he knew it, and he said, I'm giving uh, the South to the Republican Party, and little did he know <laughs> how true that would be. So that solid South, it used to be a solid Democratic South, when the Democrats um, had no problem with segregation. As soon as the Democrats woke up, found their moral compass, and said, this is not right, uh, they began to lose the South. Um, and it's essentially fully lost now. And if you look at the electoral maps and, you know, you see that red, red, and then you see the blue, some people say that it's false because of much of that, much of that is purple. And believe it or not, Barack Obama, where he picked up some of the most votes from 2008 to 2012, if you look at how he did in certain districts, uh, the reality is, is much of his, much of the biggest pickups are in southern states. And that is... Sure, as soon as I talk politics, people call. They don't want to talk about uh, Charles Dickens. Hello? Hi, I had a comment about weight loss for Lynn. Oh, weight loss, okay. You know, you were talking about the Hollywood stars that lose weight because of their parts. I just read a study that said people do lose weight when motivated by money. Ah. So I was trying to, you know, like the celebs that go on Weight Watchers. Yeah. They they're going to get $100,000. And I was like racking my brains trying to think of, can like a group of friends start a fund that's like, you get $1,000 if you lose 30 pounds? Well, a group of friends could do that, but you mean only one of the people, whoever loses it the quickest gets the money? Well, I don't know. That's what I'm saying. Well, it could ha- be your friends are thin and they're trying to help you. Oh, and so <laughs> or they your would. Your family's all- worried about you, so okay. they kick in five thousand dollars or something. <laughs> What's your price? <laughs> That's a good question because I've thought about that. I'm like, you know, what would be your price to give up what your huge weakness is? Okay, so what? What? What do you have? You figured it out? What? What would? No. Moti- what amount of money would motivate you to to tr- you know absolutely do it to stop? Well, I was thinking if it was like a company, because you figure a company has like advertising motivation, like Jared with Subway. Yeah. Like, hey, give me twenty thousand dollars, and I'll keep this weight off for five years. That would be enough. <laughs> five thousand a year. You think Jess is agreeing with you? Five thousand a year would do it. Yeah. But, see, but if it would have to be a grassroots, your friends feeling sorry for you. I don't know. <laughs> I think you ought to work on this. Do you have enough skinny friends who want you to lose weight? Well, I tend. I used to be that skinny friend, so I can totally understand why they wouldn't want to. Because it's sort of insulting. Like you can't tell your friend, "Hey, you need to lose forty pounds." Well, we're going to give you a thousand bucks. <laughs> well, but yeah, but you know, the friend who needs to lose forty pounds knows it. 
right. right? So I don't know why a friend can't say, I mean, I know you know you have to blah, 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 blah. Um, or why you couldn't go to your friends and say, I need an intervention. <laughs> Do just See, I'm it. the kind of dieter that I never get too far out of control. Like, I have my limit. Like, I will not go into that size. Oh, and so then you I stop? I don't think it's so okay. much targeted at me because I'm just vain enough to hold myself back. Uh-huh. But I have this, you know, I turned 40 and decided food was good. Well, that's a bad time to decide food is good. Oh, I love metab- food now. I never yeah. cared before. So mine, I'm still dealing with my own self-discipline. I'm not that bad off. But I'm thinking, gee, if you had like 50 or 60 pounds and someone gave you, I don't know, $1,000? I guess it depends on someone's lifestyle. No, it doesn't depend on your lifestyle. It depends on your finan- your financial, uh, you know. Yeah, that's what on- I mean. Like, is oh, a thousand okay. a lot to them? Yeah, a thousand could be nothing to somebody and everything to somebody else. So, yeah, well, if I come up with some crafty plan to motivate people, <laughs> we can start a movement. But the studies showed when it was financially motivated, every single person lost the weight. Wow. Every single person. Well... Uh, I, it's a good idea. I mean, uh, yeah, you got to figure out how to pull it together. I'm not good at stuff like this, figuring out how no, to organize something. I mean, either. That's why I was something. like, boy, that's interesting, and I it forgot is. about it until you brought up the movie stars and thought, well, there's motivation. Yeah, right. I can't tell you how good I would look and how I would exercise and get Botox if I had to be on camera in two weeks. Exactly right. You know. In fact, I can't understand sometimes when people look bad. I'm thinking, didn't you know you were going to be on TV? <laughs> <laughs> like, that's not always the motivation. It has to be the cash. It has to be the cash. How about so, your health? I'll email I, I, you I, or Facebook I, if I, I think of okay, something. Okay, all right. Hey, thanks. Okay. Appreciate yeah. it. A great call. Um, <laughs> yeah. Our own health is not a good enough motivator. It isn't. Give me money. Money. Well, okay, I'm going to drop this Lincoln thing for a second because it just occurred to me because she's talking about people on TV, and I also wanted to note this. Um, Have you heard about the two anchor people in... What was it? One of those New england states. Maine. Banger. Banger? Banger, Maine? Who both quit on the air at the same time? Is that not amazing? You know, a man and a woman, the anchor people. And they had been anchoring together there for the Bangorians uh, for like six or seven years. So they were very well known and... um, and they, it's on YouTube. I mean, they, they, they don't exactly say why, but they just, at the end of the newscast, they say, well, it's just been wonderful. And uh, there's things that have happened, and really the only thing that we feel we can do is to leave. And she says, I intend to maybe write a book, and I don't know smell the roses, and he says, I'm going to look for work somewhere, and thank you so much, and goodbye. And and, and then they, the sh- news ended, and they both hugged each other, and that was the end of it, but all hell broke loose. I mean, no one has ever seen two anchor people just flat out say goodbye when their own management didn't have a clue they were going to do that. They quit on air. In a very nice way, it wasn't in your face, it wasn't saying these SOBs we work for, blah, 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 blah. But as soon as these two did it, um, of course, the local media, the newspaper called and said, what the heck, what is that, what happened? And then the two of them uh, said they did it because... The owners of the TV station, it, it, it's such a tiny little market that um, both the Fox News station and the, uh, I think, ABC News station affiliate share 
the news uh, people. So if you turn on the Fox station, you're going to get these two. And if you turn on the ABC station, you'll get them too. So the owner owned both. And they said that the managers, particularly one, had increasingly been screwing around with the news content, saying you can't do this and I don't want that. And, you know, if you have any journalistic integrity, you're going to push back at that if it is, the sense is politically motivated. Now, the reason you might believe it's politically motivated is that the uh, general manager of these stations, a guy named Mike Palmer, uh, was famously outed back, I think, about six years ago when a memo he had written to his staff was leaked to the New York Times. And the memo said, essentially, that he did no, he refused, he did not want, you were in trouble if... Any of the newscasts that aired on his station ever had a story on global warming or climate change. And his memo said, when Bar Harbor, which is in Maine, when Bar Harbor is underwater, then you can do global warming stories. Until then, no more. So... This is the guy that, and that was, that was 2006. So six years later, this is the guy these two are still working for. And given that we already know he wrote that memo to the staff, it's easy to believe that what they're saying is true. Although, of course, he's now denying it. He's saying, he's telling the newspapers that they quit because one of them was going to be fired and the other one was disgruntled and blah, 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 blah. But there's no way that two anchors give up that job because that's a, that's a, that's a nice job. I, th- and that, that was a hard job for them because it's such a small market that they, the woman anchor was also the news director. I think she swept the studio afterwards. It's like one of those things. And, you know, doing newscasts for two different stations, that, she's working her tail off. And probably, given the size of the market, making, I don't know what, $45,000. Maybe. I mean, it's not like they're making tons of money, but it's a good job and everybody knows you and you're a star in town and blah, 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 blah. You don't give that up. So they decided that they couldn't take it anymore. And she has been quoted later as saying, we figured if we had tendered our resignations off air, we would not have been allowed to say goodbye to the community. And that was really important for us to do. Now, let me tell you how much I, I understand that. When I used to have a long-running radio show, three hours a day, Monday through Friday, on WTAE radio, um, rumors were swirling all over the place that there was going to be a format change and they were not going to do talk radio anymore. And there was a change in ownership that I, I, I don't even remember anymore. There were like, I worked for three different people within like six months. I didn't know who, what was going on. There was such turmoil. And then it became clear. It became clear that I was going to be out of a job because I don't do sports. And that they were going to go to sports. We eventually, those of us who worked on the air, were told that this was in the offing. They couldn't say exactly when the transition would occur. But, you know, you start seeing certain people leaving. There are boxes in the hallway. This and that is going on. I had worked for WTAE for 15 years, television and radio. And I had a real connection 
to my audience. I mean, as I feel like I do now. And I and they said, you cannot mention anything about this on the air. You are not to say boo. You just keep doing your show as if everything is fine and dandy, and that's that. And, and the way it works, I knew what was going to happen. Some Friday, they would, after my show, they would come and say, that's it. Don't bother coming in on Monday. And I thought, you know what? I can't stand this. I can't just disappear on my audience. I got to say goodbye. I got to say thank you. I got to say... <laughs> so right about when I figured I didn't have much time left, I flat out, despite what I'd been told, I said goodbye. I said, I don't know if this is my last show. I might well be, but I have to tell you, and you know, and we had a good hour. We did that in the last hour of people calling. We cried. We laughed. We remembered things. We this and that. It was so important for me and for them. And as soon as I got off the air, they canned me. And I, and I was not only canned, I was told you are canned with, what do they call that? With where I wouldn't get unemployment, where I wouldn't get this, where I wouldn't get that. They'd pay no severance. I was just kicked out the door in a rage. They were so furious. So I, underst I understand that. I think these two are heroes. And um, just so as you know their names, they are, who the hell are they? Cindy Michaels and Tony Consiglio. And they couldn't take it anymore. He said, this is one of the toughest decisions I've ever made. This is my career. I loved doing it. But he had integrity. He had integrity. And it's really sad that integrity is, you just don't see it that much. So, just in case you didn't see it. And that is on um, YouTube and places. I mean, it's not anything incredible to see. They're very... Pff, they don't cry, they don't this, they just say thank you very much and then and they keep their composure and then they they hugged each other. They're not married or anything. They don't have, you know, but they'd been doing that job together for all that time and I cannot begin to imagine what happened when the camera went off them because the general managers there had not a clue that this was going on. I'm sure the general manager at WTAE knowing me figured that I very well could do that. And, of course, I, I did. Um, generally, what happens in broadcasting is they don't ever let the person who's leaving say goodbye if it's um, not of their doing because they're afraid that someone will say, oh, let me tell you, about, you know, because you got a mic in front of your face. Let me tell you what SOBs these, you know, because I guess that could happen. <laughs> yes, it could, but in this case did not, and in my case did not, but to deny the audience and the person on air the right to say goodbye is really awful. We'll take a break, and I will Lord be back. The way with Lynn Cullen ah. Live. 36 countries, 150 artisan groups, a world of handmade treasures, and one place to discover them all, 10,000 villages, home decor, jewelry, gifts, all one of a kind, fashioned one at a time. 
At 10,000 villages, each item tells a story. When somebody else takes that beautiful item, I want to carry that beauty to them. They're gifts that give twice, because 10,000 villages is a fair trade retailer, providing sustainable income to artisans in developing countries. Fair trade has been the possibility to have what we have now. Enriching their lives while bringing exotic elegance into yours. Surprise your senses. Express your style. Experience the new. Step into 10,000 villages. I feel very beautiful making these products, and I want all our customers to feel beautiful wearing them. Pittsburgh City Paper is available now. Pick up one today for a preview of Southside Stories at City Theater. Plus, Kevin Smith, B.B. King, the music of Michael Jackson, and the Winter Flower Show at Phipps. Pittsburgh City Paper, available at over 1,700 locations throughout Western Pennsylvania and on the web at pghcitypaper.com and on your smartphone at citypapermobile.com. You're listening to Lynn Cullen Live at pghcitypaper.com. Once again, here's Lynn Cullen. I was just telling uh, Jess that the autopsy report on the guy who won the cockroach eating contest just came out. <laughs> he ate like a million cockroaches, got won a snake or something for a friend, and then walked out the door and dropped dead. And um, no one could figure out why, because in fact, cockroaches are not poisonous or anything. But the autopsy report says that I guess he began to vomit. Maybe just all of a sudden after he did it, the thought of what he'd done... <laughs> Made him rich, and he started to vomit, and he vomited up so many. Is that what they said? So many like cockroach legs and heads and abdomens that um, they started collecting in his, and 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 he choked to death. That's all, choked to death on cockroaches. Uh, Chrissy, in regard to dieting, writes, I have been losing weight the slow, more healthy way. Absolutely the right way to do it. Uh, and she said, you're describing the way Anne Hathaway did it. Reminded me of my developing anorexia as a teenager. Uh, she weighed 95 pounds and she was five, six and a half. Oy. Says, I was a voracious exerciser and ate teeny tiny amounts of food a day. My mother threatened to take me to a shrink, I would hope, after our vacation. I somehow snapped out of it. Boy, are you lucky. And started eating again. I have mitral valve prolapse, but was most likely there since birth. Yeah, I have mitral valve pro. Everybody's got mitral valve prolapse. And believe me, I never starved myself. Eating disorders, Chrissy writes, are bad for the heart. That's what you got to remember. And that's how, like, Karen Carpenter and all the other anorexics die. They die because their hearts give out. Um, uh, did you see gun sales? Record. Black Friday, record gun sales. We knew that after the Obama win that the gun sales would spike again, and they did. And now they're saying that on Black Friday, the guns were being bought at such a rate that, you know, and, and by law, amazingly still by law, you have to call the um, and, and, and get a background check, and that goes to the FBI. And the FBI's uh, call center crashed twice on Black Friday because it simply could not handle the number of calls. <laughs> so, what? You got a caller? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hello, caller. Hello. Hello. Hi, Lynn. Do you happen to see this Christmas card these people are doing in uh, one of these states? I can't remember. But they're taking pictures with uh, AK 47s. And you get a background check to make sure you're not crazy, but you can buy it, you know, anywhere. It's just another thing that these lunatics do. Well, have a good day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have a good day, too. 
I love that caller. He always comes in with some very short, have you seen the, 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 something so depressing that he says, have a good day. I love it. Um, Joanne Rogers, Mr. Mr. Rogers, wife, widow, I hate that word, uh, sent me this hysterical bunch of pictures of um, Christmas cards, family Christmas cards that, you know, if they thought twice, maybe they shouldn't have sent. <laughs> maybe you've seen this. Some of them are just hysterical. But there was one there with a whole family in there. <coughs> They're all packing, and that's their Christmas card. Oh, yeah. Anyway, one of the things I didn't like about Lincoln, the movie, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but at the very beginning, after they show you the, the reality, the horror of the Civil War, the hand-to-hand -hand fighting, the horror of it, the horror of it, they show Lincoln visiting the soldiers, which he did. And he's talking to these two black soldiers. And one of them is really feisty. One of them saying, hey, Mr. President, you should this and that and that. And the other one is thinking, what the hell are you saying? And blah, blah, blah. And I found that very difficult to believe. Then next to the two black soldiers comes two white kids that are soldiers. And they're talking to Lincoln. And one of them says that I heard you speak at Gettysburg. And I can't quite remember exactly, but he said one of the two began to recite, said to the president, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty. And I thought, wait a minute. The movie is happening in 1965. The Gettysburg Address was in what, 63, 64? Whatever. As we all probably know, it was universally panned, made fun of. It was considered an outrage that the president came and spoke for two seconds and left. Nobody at the time thought it was a great speech, and there's no way anybody who was there would have memorized it, let alone this kid. So I thought, oh, come on. You know, I just, I, no. And I was really put off right at the beginning by this. And to make it even worse, as the two white soldiers go away and they're left and the two black soldiers then go, um, as w the black soldier turns and leaves, he, as he's walking away, is reciting the end of the of the. Gettysburg Address. So, you know, we highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain as he's walking away. And I'm thinking, no, 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 no. That upset me. But then I think it gets really interesting. Whatever. But Charles Blow in the New York Times a few days ago asks us to ponder that the first lines of the Gettysburg Address, because I have said this many times myself. They are, they ring as true today as they did when Lincoln uttered them, because we are as divided a nation, it seems, as we were then. We're just not killing each other. And this harkens back to what I was talking about, the South, and the, that the Civil War might have been won by the North. The South never really surrendered. Think about it. Four score and seven years ago, our, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated 
can long endure. And Blow says, you know, think about this, because those words seem eerily prescient. Because we're still wondering whether a nation so dedicated and so conceived can endure. And when we look at our country and this division in it, and, and even the, you know, the absurdity, uh, but it's very telling of the secessionist movement now that's coming out of the South again. And I really feel, I know it's crazy, let them go. I have said this so often, let them go. I'm so sick of them. And this, this split does have these geographic contours where you really could just set up the old Mason-Dixon line pretty much and anybody who's really uncomfortable and finds themselves in the wrong part will have to move. So now we got all these secession petitions and what Blow says, it, you know, if you really, I mean, let's look seriously. It is really becoming very clear that the red states are becoming more and more ideologically strident. And he says, creating a regional quasi-country within a country. If you look at the laws they rush to create, we're going to be two very, I, I, I don't know, but he suggests that this division that we continue to see is one that bears, I don't, I mean, I don't think we're heading for another civil war, but I will go to my grave saying that the South never really surrendered. And I've seen it throughout my, throughout my career in front of a microphone because of the subjects that set, set off the most heat among Americans. Things like, should the state of Georgia be allowed to still be flying the Confederate flag on its state capital? Now, to me, that's a no-brainer. No! Every time I see that Confederate flag, I see red. I do. I go nuts. That's why I say they never surrendered. Because, it, you know, when you get beaten, you are certain things that you valued, like your flag, are not supposed to see the light of day anymore. That flag was taken down and replaced by the stars and stripes, right? And because Lincoln wanted healing to happen, he was very, very firm about he didn't want any kind of, you know, punishment. Of, and he even says if, if, if Jefferson Davis and all the rest of them, like, uh, well, my back is turned, leave, you know, run and hide somewhere. I ain't going to find them. I'm not going to bother with it. We need to heal. Well, we sort of pretended we healed, but we never did. We never did. You want to hear the funniest? I maybe you read this in the Sunday Post Gazette. I just had it here. The funniest thing, uh, Jack Kelly in the Post Gazette. Here's a Republican who still, this, this just shows, they got blockheads. You cannot get through to these people. Here's what he's saying. We woulda won. We woulda won. Except. We woulda won if we'd done more to appease Hispanics. 
Just the fact that he uses the word appease Hispanics as if they're some kind of, what do you mean? They're Americans. You don't have to appease them, you idiot. Care about them. Oh, such idiots. And then he says, and the big takeaway for me is how shrewd leftists were to concentrate on gaining control of our most important cultural institutions. It took time, but the payoff has been huge. Liberals and those further left dominate our public schools. Yeah, because you guys don't believe in them. We do. They dominate our colleges and universities. Yeah, because you guys don't believe in them. Remember Rick Santorum saying that Obama wants everyone to go to college. What a snob. Liberals dominate those institutions because we believe in them. The deck was stacked, he said. If the votes of only those age 30 and older counted, Romney would be president. Well, <laughs> Hey, that's a good way for the Republicans to win. Let's kill everybody under 30. Or let's get even more restrictive voting laws so that the under 30 set can't vote. And then we would have won. And then here's why he decided the younger 30 set voted for Obama. Because of incessant indoctrination by their teachers and professors. And it then outweighs their own self, rational self-interest. If this is the kind of thinking that Republicans are going to engage in, then they're still out there and they're wandering around in la-la land. <laughs> Kelly says, reclaiming a culture takes time. If we're to take advantage of opportunities when they arise, conservatives must start now. In future columns, I will suggest some ways in which we may. I will, for one, Jack, look forward to that comic relief. Wow. Okay, that's it for me. And uh, Chris Potter? joins us tomorrow, and uh, I'll look forward to that. He's a big Jack Kelly fan. He, he will be here tomorrow, and we'll have our usual Wednesday uh, fun fest, okay? You guys have a great day. Lynn Coven Live, Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. and archived at pghcitypaper.com. The opinions expressed on Lynn Coven Live are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the viewpoints of Pittsburgh City Paper, Steel City Media, and its advertisers.